Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, finally, good morning. <laughs> and yeah, hello, we got a sleepyhead beaver. Kids. And welcome to season three and episode number 300. Hey, hey, hey. Of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day is Monday, January 22nd, 2024, and uh, not sure what kind of day it is at the Beaver Lodge, to be totally honest, because the reason for which I'm so late, and I thank you so much for your patience, is because though the alarm did ring at 6.30, I guess I turned it off, or maybe it just cried itself out, and uh, I woke up at 7.02. I literally slept through. So I apologize. (laughs) These things happen. Um, All right. A big thank you goes to our podcast product sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Misty Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. As you can hear, Kids and Cubs, with me as usual is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. And let's ask him how his mental health is doing today, sir. Um, Good morning, sir. At mental health wise, uh, I've been on a bit of a roller coaster lately, mm-hmm. and sometimes I'm uh, amenable to discussing it, and some days I'm not. And it's kind of like I don't know. I, I, it's one of those things. So I'm feeling physically pretty good. Okay. Uh, I'm not unhappy. But the thing about depression is it can rob you of so many things. The the ability to enjoy the simple little things in life, the ability to have energy to get up out of bed some days, the ability to be your whole true self. So uh, I've been kind of under the radar about it, but I've, I've been battling for the last couple of weeks. And, you know, for the most part, I'm in a good mood because I'm a happy person because I choose to be happy and my brain chemicals are operating at a, a good enough level that I can be happy. But I don't have 100% of the energy that I should have at mm. this time of the year. Now, yesterday, I actually woke up, got out of bed, and I was wide awake within five or ten minutes, which is incredibly rare for me. So I got up, made coffee, and, and Bridget came into the, the – I was in the studio, and she goes, are, are you, like, up, up? I go, yeah. I am. I'm wide awake. I'm getting stuff done. She's like, holy crap. I go, yeah, I I think I slept really well. I feel pretty good. Today's going to be productive. And yesterday was a very productive day. I got a few things done around here and then went over to Bridget's place and I had about four or five little mini projects that I wanted to take care of. Got them all done. So yeah, that, that was satisfying. And I think I've turned the corner. Uh, Canal is open, so I'm going for a skate at the end of my work day, which will you know, I, I wanted, I've been telling everybody how I'm going to head back to the gym shortly. And I am. But before I do that, I want to get some good cardio exercise in. So I don't show up at the gym like, you know, 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but he mm -hmm. was completely incapable of doing anything. So yeah, I'll be out on the canal a couple of days of this week to get some good leg workout and some good cardio in. And I will be back in the gym the following week. So I think that will help with my mental health because, uh, you know, prior to the pandemic, I was in the gym seven days a week. I was in the best shape of my life. And then the whole world came to a screeching halt and uh, not had the motivation to get back in. And, you know, it's we've all had our daily struggles over the last four years because everything's been, well, for want of a better term, topsy-turvy, upside down, backwards and twisted. So as we get used to the new normal and have to readjust the way we've been doing things for the last, well, most of our lives up until the last four years, I find that uh, although my mental health uh, has been quite good in the sense that I've been happy, which is important, I have not been feeling uh, that many feelings of unhappiness, but I still get that emptiness, worthlessness feeling, which depression likes to, likes to present to us almost daily. So this is a bit of a confession on my part. Yeah, I've been keeping it under my hat because I just wasn't capable of discussing it. And I talked to Bridget about that yesterday. I said, you know, when I'm in the middle of it, I can't talk about it. When I come out the other side, I can completely uh, openly discuss it with anybody who wants to talk to me. But when I'm, you know, when you're, when you're in the boat and the boat starts to sink, you're just going to concentrate on bailing the water out as quickly as possible. So that's kind of where I've been the last few weeks. And I think, I think I've rounded a corner. I'm not, I'm not fully there, but I'm, I'm awfully darn close. If that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry to learn you were struggling. I had no idea. It's one of those things I'm used to not, um, showing it. I'm used to keeping it hidden. And when you've done that for a lifetime, trying to change that is really incredibly difficult, incredibly challenging. And not only that, like I said, when I'm in the middle of it, I can't discuss it. So I just keep it to myself. And, you know, I've, I've said many days on how I was doing good and, and truth, truth be told, I, I was happy, you know, happy to get up in the morning, happy to go to work, uh, happy with life. But there is that other looming dark cloud that, that, you know, uh, kind of takes over things but thankful for the medication which would have me without it i i i don't know where i would be probably in a hospital to be honest with you so yeah i just mm -hmm. uh keep coming up keep coming up for air every now and then and right now i think my head is uh above the water line okay oh so, yeah i think we'll be okay it's just you know i got some more work to do but here we are keep pushing forward right. Oh. Like I said, I, I hear you when you say that you don't normally talk about it when it happens, but, you know, should it come by again and should you want to or try something different, I'm here. I know. I thank you. Um, I have I have a lot of people in my corner for me for, for times like those. And uh, every now and then I will reach out and just say, look, I'm not doing good. And, okay, you want it? No, I don't want to talk about it. Let's go watch a hockey game. Let's go to a movie. Let's do anything to get my mind off of this. I will reach out on occasion. Uh, just haven't been able to lately. And, and Bridget sort of looked at me yesterday, like, what's up? So we, we sat down and had a really nice chat and she's like, okay, good. I just, you know, I was worried about you. I was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm okay. I'm just working it through, you know, and that's mental health. You know, it, you yeah. got to work through it. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Oh man. Um, I am. Uh, I'm in a weird place too. Um, yeah, I'm happy. That's good. All that kind of stuff. I think I had an incredible weekend. If you listen to the podcast, uh, yeah. not, not weekend, but incredible time at uh, the Madonna concert. Loved it. Loved it. Great show. Time with my girls. All that kind of stuff. It was great. Um, if you want to know more, you're going to have to watch the podcast because I don't want to repeat myself. But uh, <laughs> but it was it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, came back, uh, had a good weekend. Um, not as productive as I would have liked, mm -hmm. but more restful. Oh, that's which good. I needed because I'm about to that. enter a busy period. Um, and last night, I even managed to get to bed at a great hour that would have guaranteed me close to 
full eight hours of sleep or the possibility for full eight hours sleep, which very rarely happens on Mm -hmm. the evening before a show. Uh, But something happened. (laughs) And I won't say what it is here. Okay. Mm. Oh, that reminds me. I need to get that radio ad to you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I will get that done today. I promise you this. Uh, okay. My apologies that I didn't. I, this whole weekend, I was just nonstop. Go, 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 go. That's go. all right. That's all right. Uh, and I was not permitted to sleep the full night. So I was up from about 3.43 to 5.30, which might explain one of the reasons why I slept yeah. through. And I was mad. Squinted and confused. And I was mad. Not only was I up, but I was mad. Listen, when, when he like, <laughs> looked up, I saw him in the green room. He's walking towards his chair. So I clicked this, I clicked the camera on and he sits down and I looked at him and I went, oh, dude, you look tired. <laughs> I am tired. <laughs> so somehow I slept at least five hours. I'm sure somewhere in that amount of time, but I feel like I slept on the clothesline. So here's the thing. Uh, whether you realize it or not, and a lot of people are not fully aware of this, so I will just bring it out there in case I've never done this before. Four hours sleep is what the human body needs to function. Okay? Function. Are you going to be effective? Probably not. Are you going to be productive? Doubtful. But you can function. Less than four hours and you're a danger to yourself and everyone around you. More than four hours and your, your ability to perform at a, at a better level improves. But if you get, if you get four hours, you can function yeah. less than that. And it's, it's dangerous. Like really less than four hours, you should not be doing literally anything. <laughs> and I'm not joking. Mm. I know I was in a sleep study. I was in a uh, group, uh, group therapy for folks with terrible insomnia. And one of the individuals that was in that group, uh, her insomnia was so bad that her mental health was worse than mine had ever been, ever. And thankfully, through group, she was able to land a job, get a job that worked around her sleep schedule. She needed 13 hours a night. And the doctor who was running the thing said, yeah, some people need that. It's a fallacy that everybody needs eight hours. Fallacy. Some people need more. Some people need less. Me, six. That's all I need. More than six, and I wake up tired. Like if I sleep in on a Saturday, which occasionally I'll sometimes sleep in till seven or maybe eight, like this week I slept in till eight, it takes me a while to get going from there. Uh, by 9.30, I'm like, okay, let's get some stuff done. But more than six hours for me, not good. <laughs> James, he, uh, he's looking for a roommate because he's in <laughs> Whitby with his mom. And if, and this offer is serious, um, if you want to move to Killaloo or if somebody is nearby in Killaloo and wants to stay rent free in a 4,000 square foot house, that's free food, free internet, free rent. So he can see his kids. Yeah. If anybody wants to do that, I don't know anybody in Killaloo. I know people in Pembroke, mm-hmm. rent free, <laughs> prior, but I don't know anybody in Killaloo, so... We'll see what we can do for you, buddy. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I hear you. It's the only way to see your kids. And if you care about your kids, then yeah, he, you do what he, you have he, to do. He desperately um, needs to see his children. You know? yep. um, this, this is a man who is really um, needs his kids in his life, right? Uh, some, some guys don't uh, feel that way. That's not the case with James. He needs his children in his life. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah, I hear you. Don't need advice. I need a roommate. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, it'll happen, my friend. It'll yeah. happen. It'll happen. It'll happen for you. Okay, kids and cubs. Um, clearly, I don't have anything necessarily prepared, <laughs> so we're going to be jumping uh, to a couple of things here and there. I do have but, something for you, though. Okay, if you want to start, sure. yeah, I'm just going to bring this up, and uh, so so. We'll all get it. Okay. So we get the pronunciation correctly. Shataka. 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 Oh, yeah, sorry. Ms. Shataka. Ms. Shataka. There we go. Shataka. Yeah, she sent me a, a link on the weekend so we could f- figure out the proper pronunciation. There we go. 
Okay, now I just have to remember and retain. <laughs> just every now and then if you struggle, I have it right here for you. All right, thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, it's really important. It is. We, we like to get things uh, right. Yes. I was sent some links on the weekend. I'm not, we're not going to we're not going to discuss them. I sent some links on the weekend from somebody saying, you should talk about this on your show. I'm like, I can't. Why not? Well, that's a single source. It's a single source. It's not corroborated. It, there's no peer reviewed papers about this single source story. And until I get, and it's, and, and the story came from the Western standard. So <sighs> I said, we need to, I said, we, we need to vet our sources. Number one, number two, we uh, look at multiple corroborating stories to make sure that, okay, it looks like this is an accurate picture. I said, we do not peddle in conspiracy. So the story that was sent to me is interesting, but I've only seen one publication talk about it. And there was one single press conference and that was it. So we're not going to discuss it on this show until we have more information. Number one and number two, discussing it on this show, even with, if we have all the right information could probably get us banned. So I don't think we're going to go that route. Had to do with um, okay. vaccination. Oh. Yeah. So it, it's, uh, look, the story looks conspiratorial. Is, is it true? I don't know. I uh, would have to do a lot more reading to find out. And we have to check with multiple sources. Again, we look at, uh, what, what is it, NACI? We look at uh, World Health Organization, CDC, uh, Canadian um, Health Health Canada, I should say. And then we'll look at, you know, the New England Journal of Medicine, peer-reviewed newspaper, peer-reviewed papers before we would publish or, or discuss a story that right now doesn't look legit to me. I'm not saying it isn't. I'm saying I need more information. So for the folks who sent me that on the weekend, I haven't disregarded it. But until I have a chance to really make sure that there's some accuracy to it we're not going to discuss it hmm. yep that's pretty much our policy yeah yeah, it, yeah we just need single source reporting unless you know again it's a source that's known and trusted and reputable for having mm -hmm. you know produced lots you know like if susan delacourt sends something that it's a scoop or something it's like this you know okay we'll talk about it she's established but yes yeah. This is uh, this was an article in the Western Standard on the weekend about a Japanese doctor who purported something that I, I'm sorry, it's I need more. Yeah, yeah need we more. need more. Yeah, we need more. It's a certain certain thing as well. Same thing as uh, you know, there's a lot of talk on the on the internet about certain alleged scandals that the conservatives say about you know, funds, certain funds, and certain apps and stuff, and it's like. Yeah. Until it's somebody other than just you guys saying it. We ain't doing a thing. Sorry. We need more. Because, again, you know, reputations precede people. And, you know, if, if you have a tendency to not be engaging in the truth, only the truth and nothing but the truth, yes. the full truth, you know, twisting, twerking, misinformation, disinformation, that stuff, doesn't mean that you ain't, you ain't capable of producing an accurate story every now and then, but you get something real. It's just, you know, if we're separating the wheat from the chafe, you're giving us a lot of chafe. Yes. So, And you know. I understand there's, there's a lot of folks out there who are looking for alternative sources for, for news. I get that. Yep, absolutely. I, and, and I don't even have an issue with that. But again, if it's only one, they're like, well, you need critical thinking. I go, no, it's not. It's not. I have critical thinking. I'm capable of it. What I need is corroborating stories. I need evidence. I need peer reviewed papers from medical journals that are well respected and have been. Yeah. I, Cause we're, we're not journalists. We're not. Again, we are curators, commentators, and analysts. So if we're going to bring something to you, we have to be sure that the source is reputable yes, and that we've seen it in a couple of places and we've got a couple of different takes to provide some analysis. Exactly. I mean, in other words, you know, you, so you can't just hand us something and say, here, talk about this. We have, we have no way. There's just us two. We have no staff. We have no fact check team. We have no, <laughs> right. 
it's, it's us literally doing comparative readings and, you know, remembering stuff that happened in the past and bringing it forward, connecting dots and making links and mm -hmm. looking for consistency and coherence and constancy over time. Is what, I mean, if you just hand us a website and said, read this. And go, oh, yeah, now, we don't know if we don't know who you are as the source who's handing it to us and we don't know the source who's publishing it and we have no, we can't run with that. We can't run with that. We want to bring a quality product. So we, you know, and if we have a facts first approach, mm -hmm. we have to actually make sure that what we're bringing forth is facts. Period. So, so things that are measurable, that are verifiable, that are corroborated, that you can see in many, many people running with, many people talking about, mm -hmm. not just one source, not just one side of the political spectrum. Well, and this is it because we we will report on anything. It doesn't matter who the the politician is, or or mm -hmm. you know, if it's truthful and factual we're gonna we're gonna put it out there yeah we're not Again, neutral but we're truthful we're truthful we're truthful and, and you know if I, you look at the the headline topic that i started uh, that i wrote about today how the <laughs> the um rebel news followed mark carney around davos making him trend today or yesterday pierre polyev called mark carney the new lp liberal party of canada leader after saying he would ban ministers from attending the world economic forum yeah yeah but but okay. he's all about the freedom right yes. i'll make canada the freest nation on earth exactly so but you can only do what i tell you to do yeah you can't go here you can't hang around with these people you can't go to this organization that's textbook yeah. fascism yep that's number one so but again this guy's the most inauthentic person like dean says he is canada's big lie the man is a fraud completely so he's not about freedom uh, then the whole Mark Carney is the Liberal Party leader. Um, that's a wishful thinking mm -hmm. expressed as fact because Pierre Poitiev would much rather have Mark Carney be the leader right now yes, than Justin Trudeau because Mark Carney, even though he has a reputation in certain circles and a lot of people have his, know his name, not many Canadians know much about him because, well, banks have governors of the Bank of Canada don't necessarily have media scrutinizing their personal lives, pretty much just their decisions. And then he went off to England for a while. Yeah, Bank he of did England a good job that. there, but he was even less accessible to our press. Right? So there's a rumor he might, he wants the job. There's a rumor he'll throw his hat in the ring at some point. Yeah, that's fine. And you can start Ooh. speculating and doing pieces about him if you think that that's going to happen. But the reason for which he wants Mark Carney and he wants him to think everybody to think that Mark Carney is some type of puppet master is because it's easier for him to run against Mark Carney because he can define Mark Carney. Mm -hmm. The conservatives have been trying to define Justin Trudeau for the better part of a decade now. And too many Canadians have seen the man in action for too long to know that most of the stuff that they say about him is just not true. Right? He is not a tyrant because they've been calling him a tyrant for the better part of the last four years and none of them have gotten arrested for it or thrown in jail. So if he was a tyrant. Tyrants, yeah. tyrants tend to be a little thin skinned about being called tyrants in public. Indeed. Typically. So, you know, so they try to define them all they want, but it's only the people that, you know, that are choosing to not live in a world that's tethered somewhat to reality that can take that narrative and go. Now you could be frustrated with them and, you know, turn around and say, yeah, like this, but even well, most people who do that, you know, say, yeah, he's a little tyrannical. No, he's not a tyrant. So, yeah, running against someone who doesn't have a good, a fully defined public image makes it easier for you to define them. And that's what he would rather run against. So that's, the, that's the political strategy behind that one. You know, it's the same thing where, you know, they're saying that it's Jagmeet Singh really running the ship or it's, you know, whatever. That's the whole, it's the same strategy behind saying liberal NDP coalition, because, you know, if you think the NDP is running things and oh my God, the money, because they spend like drunken sailors, even though all analysis, in fact, shows that they are the most financially stable and responsible governments, at least at the provincial level, at the federal level, we don't know because they've never had a chance to govern. So, you know, they have their tropes and they like to use them and 
those tropes work easier on people mm -hmm. that are not well defined already in the public sphere than people that you've got to see in action for close to a decade. Well, and, and that is the consideration too, because Mark Carney, even when he was the head of the Bank of Canada, it's not like he's in the news every day. No, he's not in the news every day. And, so, you know, but here's the other thing too, right? We know what the steps are. But Pierre Polyev right now is saying that he would fire the current governor, bank, governor of the Bank of Canada yes. and keeps on yeah. blaming him as well as Trudeau for everything that's bad under the sun. So once you say that Mark Carney's pulling the strings, and, oh, guess what? He was a central banker. He's going to destroy your lives. He's going to print more money, just like the, all that. That's the setup, right? Like this, the whole part about him having been such a good central banker back in the days when he was a central banker that actual, the motherland UK picked him up, <laughs> mm -hmm. said, uh, come and help us over here, is not going to matter. Well, and, right? and let's remember, he was the one who managed us through the 2008 financial crisis, right? So Exactly. And, when, and, and they praised him then. They praised him then. Well, that's exactly it, Mr. Grizzly. I'm glad that you mentioned that because uh, I think thanks to our friend Thunder Bay Ed, mm -hmm. there's this little uh, clip of Pee Pee oh. circulating on Twitter. Do tell, sir. Do tell. Oh, you did not hear it. Yes. See, it seems that as we mentioned, get your tinfoil hats, shine them, polish them off, you know, because the WEF has started. Well, then, you know, back again, he is doing all this posing. I would never allow my ministers and all that kind of stuff. But um, as we said on the show previously, the conservatives weren't always anti-WEF. Yeah. There was, uh, you know, Prime Minister Harper went there a few times. Really interesting that uh, Pierre Polyev is saying that he would have forbidden his Somebody should ask him if he would have forbidden his former boss from having gone if he was the leader back then. This this statement here from James that I just put on the screen is dead bang on. Pierre Polyev is banking on the public having regime fatigue or leader fatigue, regime fatigue. He thinks no matter who runs, the cons win. He would rather Carney run in an unwinnable election so that it ruins a viable candidate for the next election. And that's the game he's playing. The, the thing that is most disturbing to me is that there there are a number of Canadians that are having that game played on them. And when you have the Toronto Star printing stories like, oh, or Justin Trudeau knows you hate him. I'm like, oh, okay, that's strange, but whatever. I, I don't care. You go ahead and print whatever you want. It doesn't matter to me, but it seems like a strange story. But when you have national newspapers saying stuff like that, people who only get their news in, in small chunks here and there start to believe what they read, even from reputable sources who, who aren't necessarily being untruthful, but they're not giving you the whole picture. So you get a, a headline or a snippet of a sound bite and suddenly think, oh, the sky is falling. He's a dictator. Yeah. When there's no evidence to back up that statement at all, <laughs> mm -hmm. he froze bank accounts actually he didn't do that and the bank accounts that were frozen were done so under the emergency act which was brought in by a conservative government brian mulroney who ended the war measures act which was only ever enacted by justin trudeau's father pierre trudeau during the uh, october crisis in 1970 but we're not going to get into the history of it but well we don't have to get into the history of it but again Compared to other nations, how much terrorism, domestic terrorism have we had since right. the FLFU crisis? Because we sent the message, you try to pull that, we don't pull that shit here. Because when you pull that shit, this is what we do. Well, in the UK, what they've been doing with individuals who have left and gone to other, uh, I'll say, war-torn countries. I don't want to even name the organizations that they're involved with because that could get us in hot water. But individuals who are returning to England after having gone abroad and, and worked for, I'll say, the other side, if you will, uh, they're not allowed to come back to England. And if they try to come back, the, they're unalived by the state, is what's happening. Hmm. And people are cheering that on. I'm like, huh, maybe, maybe if they look like me, they wouldn't cheer it on as much. Mm -hmm. You know, 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I have to be vague sometimes to, to avoid yeah, yeah. to avoid you. the uh, the algorithm that runs the medium that we're on because we're a small channel. We are growing. We are growing, but you know, I don't. We don't want to get any flags or violations. Yeah. So speaking of Mr. Carney uh, and the oh, conservatives, the not always there. yes, the video, uh, the conservatives not always being against the WEF and not even always against Mark Carney. Mm-hmm. Let me just blow this up here, mm-hmm. and right. I will put it so, on the screen. Let's have a little flashback. This is MP Gerritsen that uh, found this, but this yeah. is a uh, yeah two two thousand. Around 2010-ish. Oh, you're going to love this, kids. This is, uh, this is Skippy being Skippy. Uh, here we go. Watch this. Mr. Speaker, the World Economic Forum's 2009-2010 Global Competitiveness Report has again ranked Canada as having the world's soundest banking system. Canada's banks and other financial institutions are sound and well capitalized and we're less highly leveraged than our international peers heading into this global financial crisis. Okay. Now, he cites the WEF and mentions compared to our peers. Mm -hmm. So he is capable of taking economic data and placing it in an overall context of comparing it to our near peer nations and seeing how we're doing, right? Keep that in mind for something that's coming later. Yes. Um, Then, according to Mark Garrison, also in 2012, while in government, he was sharing ideas and concepts in parliamentary committees he learned about from the WEF. Does this sound like someone who was always vehemently opposed to the WEF? Mr. Grizzly. Well, sir, let me just read this to you. Give me a sec here. The next question I have relates to electric vehicles. I'll quickly note that in Alberta, electric vehicles might actually be a less environmentally friendly option because of the mix of electrical sources. I don't know the exact numbers, but I know that a very large portion of Alberta's electricity is coal-fired. You'd have to burn coal in order to power the vehicle, which is much dirtier than burning natural gas. On electric-powered vehicles generally, Israeli CEO Shai Agassi stated at the World Economic Forum that he wanted to create one country that didn't rely on oil for anything. He chose Israel. He said that the solution for electric vehicles was to have battery swap stations. That is to say, even though there is not a lot of range with electric vehicles, a car could pull into one of these swap stations and the battery could be changed in under two minutes and then be on its way. In effect, no one would actually own a battery. They would just pay for the use of batteries that they would swap in and out of these at these stations. Is that a viable option? So back then, he was concerned about viable options. Oh, electric car vehicles, but now he's anti doing anything for climate change. <laughs> the hypocrisy. Oh, man. oh boy. I got to save that image for, for future. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. But ever since he learned that hating the WEF could get him likes and clicks and especially donations. Yes. Funny how that works. Huh? Now his tune has changed. Well, and of course people will say, well, you know, people uh, grow and change. And yes, that is true. He hasn't. <laughs> He's just using whatever he can to win the nanosecond. That's all he's ever done. He will be a turncoat in two seconds flat if he can find something that will give him an edge over somebody else. Period. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much, my friend. Um, Now, the interesting thing about this is that... um, yeah, former Prime Minister Jacques Chrétien, who just turned 90. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's an interview he gave to CTV News with Vashi Capellas on Question Period a while ago. Uh, not too long ago, about, about a week ago. And she was asking about a whole bunch of stuff. And 
you know, was trying to get into the, get him to answer a question about whether or not, uh, you know, uh, Justin Trudeau should, should step aside or whatnot, you know, and being the cagey politician that he always is, you know, well, that decision is up to him. And she asked him in three or four different ways. And finally, he says, yeah, but if he were to ask for your advice, and then she says, well, he's not going to ask for my advice. So there's no point in discussing it now, really. <laughs> so at 70, he's still sharp. Yes. Right. He can still do that. 90, 90, not 70. Uh, 90, 90, sorry. 90, sorry. Yeah, 90 is what I meant. Uh, you know, he can still uh, deke and bob and weave uh, with the best of them. He never lost his stuff. Oh yeah, no, no. He he's he has all his faculties, all his fa- faculties. Um, but she um she was asking him about you know the statements that Canada was broken, mm. and you know he wasn't at all at all having that. He doesn't buy that whatsoever. And he had a really, really great, great response to her. And his response was sort of what Pierre was doing in that QP video where he was taking some data and he was placing it within the global context. Right? Mm -hmm. So I saw this comment on Twitter from like former, I think it was a former president of the Liberal Party, Stephen LeDrew, who went right somehow, somewhere along the way. You know, saying Justin Trudeau has failed on every possible metric or characteristic and then just went on. And it's like, well, that's an empty, meaningless feelings statement. It's like, show us some empirical data. What are those metrics on which he's failed? Show them to us. Yes, please. Place those metrics within the context of where our near peer countries and other leaders in our near peer countries are doing on those metrics. And bonus points if you're able to keep those metrics to things that are not constitutionally under the purview of provincial premiers. Because we're talking about healthcare delivery, if we're talking about building homes, if we're talking, that's not his job. He has to take on some of that job. Because he's faced with a merry bunch of conservative, merry bunch of or band of conservative premiers that are not willing to actually do their job. Of course not. Right? You got Mr. Cho here in Ontario, Minister Cho, talking about beer and corner stores coming soon, like in 2025, which is really soon. 2026. Or 2026. Oh, great. Because that's something that they can control because they can't control what's going on in ERs. Yeah. One, because they're not willing, and two, because they're trying to break the system. So that they can have their private sector friends come in and charge you through the nose. Yes. So they talk about stuff that they can control. Oh, look at that. We're going to be bringing beer in stores. Look at us. Aren't we so great? And aren't we so effective? And look at this. We're going to like, you know, cancel your license plate renewals. Oh, look at that. Of course, they do it in such a way that you don't know that even though you still have to renew that you don't. And then you do that late. And that's where you get dinged for the money. Yeah, you still have to renew. You just don't pay anything. Yeah, because they also don't send you anything no to tell you that you're supposed yeah. to renew. Oh, yeah, that's, there's no notification anymore. You I know a few folks have already got nailed. Yeah. So yeah, $400 they, fines. Yeah, they give with one hand and they take away with the other. Yeah. So they're going to get that license plate uh, renewal fee money by simply fining you $450. <laughs> so instead of paying 120 or 250 for a year or two years, and you're now going to pay $450 because you're going to get a fine. <laughs> Pretty good scam, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, seriously, it's a great scam. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Mr. Grizzly, I found uh, the clip here for you. And it's got the last little bit with the Vashi Capellos answering, you know, but if he, but if he were to ask you. Um, One second, sir. Hopefully this will work, doing it from my end. Just press play and let's see. Okay. Uh, okay. Hopefully the volume will be good. Uh, there's no sound. 
and there's no sound. Why does this do this to me? I don't know. <sighs> All right. I'll send you the clip with the timestamp. And okay, then I'll, I'll look for it up. I don't yeah, know I don't why know this why. part this part doesn't work since we uh, since I upgraded. Yeah, I don't know why. There's there's end. a setting in there. So what, what did you just send me? No, you sent me this restream link, dude. Ugh. <laughs> I'm like, huh? What's going Tech on there? Is hating me. <laughs> <laughs> you sent me the link it's for hating me for what we're looking why at. Does it hate me. What have uh, I done to tech? I don't know. Uh, I honestly couldn't All tell right. you. Okay, so the timestamp's yeah. eleven twenty on that one when we get there. Um, yeah, I forgot where we were. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's okay. It happens. Jeez. Wow. Um, okay, I got it queued up. Uh, All right, ready to roll here. Just give me a sec while I minimize that. And I will just share the tab and bring this up on the screen and we'll have a look at it. Yes, and you know, that's life and it's a political life and you have to live with it. So, if he that's asked, life. If he asked you, what would you tell him? Oh, well, nah, he will not ask me. So why to debate? We're talking about decisions. My final question for you, Mr. Kutche, as you look back and as the country is looking back, on your time in politics, your 60 years since you became an MP, 30 years since you became Prime Minister, 90 years here on Earth. Is there a, a, a decision specifically or something that you did when you were in office that stands out to you as the most consequential one that you made? But many. So it's what is difficult. Some say it's because when I decided we'd balance the book. I remember one of the ministers who is still a member of parliament, uh, Lawrence McCauley, called his wife after the meeting and he said that, darling, I'm back on the farm next summer, uh, next election, and he's still there. So it was a very important one. When I passed the Clarity Act, when I, you know, a lot of people said, don't do that, you will, you know, you will start the storm, and there was no storm. And after that, when I said no to the war in Iraq, you know, it's something, it was, and it was a very important decision to show that we were not the 51st state of America, that we were an independent country. But you'd make the decision, you have to make the decision. So you make the best decision possible. Which one was the most important? You can decide for me. <laughs> the people will decide, as yeah, you they said. Have yeah. decided, and they are very nice to me these days. And, uh, <laughs> I'm having a good time at my age. Well, I'm sure on behalf of them and behalf of us here, happy birthday to you, Mr. Kitchen. Thank you very and much. And I appreciate you making the time for our conversation. Thank you very much. So I wanted to play that part because I like the end answer. But if you go to 406 on that one, Mr. Grizzly. Just to Sorry. Just bear with we, get to the, we get to the part where, where was, to which I was uh, speaking of earlier. Where, um, she's asking him a bit about the state of politics and how it's changed and about Canada being broken. And... I like what Mr. Kretzian does here, and we need more politicians doing this type of thing to make sure that there's some messages countering the BS that's coming from the conservative side. Okay, second while I bring this up. And really try to do a good job. Do you think the public's perception of politics and politicians, though, is still one of nobility and do you think that the whole trajectory the whole whatever drama you want to call it of donald trump in the united states has impacted that yes somewhat probably we'll see that later on as i said yesterday i was involved in politics in 1956 i was the president of the young liberal in laval university so I watched politics since that time. I never woke up in the morning with one big headline. Canada had a great day yesterday. We must have had at least one <laughs> in these uh, 68 years, something like that. But it is the nature of communication. A good news is not a news, a bad news is a news. As I said, for, you know, a, a, a dog who bite a man is not a news. But if a man was to bite a dog, it would be a hell of a big news, and it's two animals doing the same thing. <laughs> so, you know, we have to be realist and look at the life and do what you can. 
And for me, I always done my best, and I could not do better than my best. Perhaps my best was not good enough for some, but there's nothing I can do about it. You know, though, that a lot of the way in which politics is perceived right now is this idea of resonating with people's frustrations, uh, with their anger. And there are a lot of Canadians right now yeah, who feel are, down, yeah, right? But, but the anger is based on what? That's what I'm asking. Do you, you, know, you know, we have the per capita, the lowest per capita debt of the G7. We have the lowest deficit per capita of the G7. You know, we used to talk about creating jobs. Now we cannot find people to fill the jobs. The business community is always complaining. Since five years, the recession is coming. They are disappointed they don't have yet a recession. You know, it's always like that. Be a realist. Look at that. Canada is doing better than anybody else. So you don't but think Canada is broken? No. The broken, you know. It's millions and millions of people around the globe who will want to come in two so-called broken nations. <laughs> you had the Minister of Immigration earlier. You know, we could open the gates for millions of people if we wanted. We have a land of diversity. We have two official languages. We don't have violence. Uh, we don't have ghettos. Uh, you know, we have some problem. You know, sometimes you have problem in your own house. So it's normal that we have in a country problems, but we're there to solve them. And sometimes I say, when you're in public life, to fill a hole, you have to dig two or two or two, two or more to have enough land to fill the first one. So it's a never ending. And, and I understand everything you're saying. I think at the same time, people in their own lives can feel, especially right now, like it's very hard to pay their bills. They're very worried about but things like But it's always like, like that. You know, as I said yesterday, you know, when I became prime minister, inflation, interest rate were 11 percent. Unemployment was 11 percent. We were spending 35 cents in every dollar of tax to pay the interest of the debt. I was the first one to balance the book. Even Polyev said that yesterday. That Mr. Christian was the young one to balance the books. So uh, we can do that, but when you do that, it's not easy. But uh, I did that. You did make, though, a lot of very tough decisions. You mentioned even the Conservatives now point to your government and the way in which you uh, eventually balanced the books, the decisions you made around the deficit and the debt as you know things that, that others should be following in the footsteps of. Uh, do you think more of those hard decisions have to be made? Relatively, yes. But when we compare ourselves, you know, I told you, the debt is lower than the others and so on. We're reducing the debt in relation to the GDP every year. We're one of the few to do that. But it's not what you read, you know. They say it's terrible and the people always say it's awful and so on. Now, come on, we have to be realists too. You know, we're doing quite well in Canada compared to anybody else. And when I used to say that, when I look at myself, I despair. When I compare myself, I feel very good. There you go, well, Mr. Grizzly. Well. Reality he's, uh, check. He's still sharp as a tack. And I, I, don't, I don't agree with everything he says. Uh, I think some of what he says is a little dismissive of, of those of us who are having a hard time however when he when it comes to uh paying down debt when it comes to uh debt to gdp when it comes to how well our country is doing economically speaking on a global scale how our inflation is lower than and that we're far from being the worst ever that we've ever had we've had way worse way worse he's right about all those things and he's you're not gonna you're not gonna slip one past him. Yeah. He might come off as that little guy from Shawinigan. He's six foot four, uh, but a six two, six four. He's a big guy to begin with, but he's always when he speaks. Uh, this is a well educated man, but when he speaks, he speaks on a level that everybody can relate to, and he does that intentionally. He doesn't want to talk over people. He wants to talk to people, which is why he has his sort of folksy way about him. And he chose to do that intentionally because he said, look, if I, if I have to communicate with the vast majority of Canadians, the vast majority of Canadians do not have an Ivy League type education. 
they most likely will have post-secondary education, but they didn't go to a an elite school somewhere. So I can't speak to people at their level if I talk down to them. So I'm going to speak to people on their level. I've always respected that. And, and a lot of things he did while he was prime minister, I'm still angry about the helicopter thing that cost us billions of dollars. What he did to John Nunziata, I've never cared for. But uh, when it came to the Iraq war, when it came to uh, same-sex marriage, the man stood up. The man stood up both times. On, and when, when they asked him, I remember in an interview, they said, but you're, you're, you're Christian, you're a Catholic, shouldn't you be against gay marriage? And he says, my job as the prime minister, my religion gets checked at the door. When I enter that office, I have to represent every Canadian and I have to stand up for the marginalized communities that has nobody to represent them. And I went, whoa, I did not see that coming. He won me over in that moment. Yeah. Because yeah. he was he was governing for all Canadians. Yep, indeed. So, you know, and I understand what you mean because when he said that thing too, I, at first I thought it was dismissive, but when after when he places it back, I had 11% interest rates and 11% unemployment. Yes. So I understand people complaining that times are tough and that I can't pay my bills because he's, he's not only has he been there, but no matter what the economic conditions are, there will always be a group of people yes. who are going through a tough time. Like it or not, it's just simple. There will always be. Yeah. Right? So that's going to be a constant. But yes, that could have been framed with a little more delicatesse. Right. That, and that's yeah. all I'm looking for, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it could have. It could have been. But it is it is also true. It's like, yeah, that but that's always the case. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. That'll never change. Um, so yeah, that we need more leaders. Who can do that and the liberals certainly wouldn't hurt themselves from taking this data and placing it in context because it was like we said like during the pandemic we said our kids are falling behind compared to who nobody's in school right now they're not falling behind compared to their peers and they're not falling behind compared to their near peer nations because we were all in similar shelter at home that organized like situations like compared yeah. to whom compared to whom exactly it's like everybody the whole globe was falling behind well, where we should have been in normal circumstances but we were not in normal circumstances so of course things also, are going to slip that yeah. that's what happens in abnormal circumstances that was the thing that really made me uh chuckle tremendously was all oh, our, our children are falling behind in school everybody is we're all we're all in the same, we're all in the same ocean. A lot of Some people of fell behind are, on their careers. A lot of people fell behind, you know. But, but what I'm getting at was we're all in the same ocean and it's at low tide and all our boats and ships and yachts and pieces of driftwood that we're hanging on to are all on the bottom of the, the Bay of Fundy right now. And when the tide comes back in, it's going to lift us all up. We're all in the same ocean, you know. <laughs> Yeah, not in the same way. Yeah, exactly. It's like some of us are riding in yachts and some of us are riding in canoes that have little holes in them that we're bailing from like this, but we're all in the same ocean. Um, now, another thing uh, going on is that um, it seems that Pierre Poliev has decided once again that not only is the federal government his enemy, never his conservative provincial premiers, but once again, the mayors. Because he's going after him again. Um, he has gone after the mayor of Toronto Olivia a couple of days ago because of the property tax hike. And Something he has gone after them for a long time. Yes. And he has gone after the mayor's of Montreal and Quebec City specifically yes. because of housing. Now, because housing is done at the provincial level in in uh, in Quebec. 
it's not built at the municipal level for public. It's done provincially, yes. unlike the rest of the provinces and territories. And Quebec, that I know of, is still the only province that has accepted federal money. Because municipalities have been taken, but in Quebec, and the premier of Quebec was also the first one to run to a mic last December, saying, uh, we need to get this solved like really quickly because he wanted to take that nine hundred million dollars and put it in his budget. Yes. So it makes when it he was tabling like... his provincial budget, right? So Quebec is not. Yeah, Polyev has essentially lost Quebec. Oh, yeah, completely already. Well, right? he's he's called uh, them separatist how many times recently? Uh, like, come on, dude, you cannot win without Quebec, so you're not winning anything. Well, I mean, you can still win without Quebec, but... but it's he, pretty he, damn difficult. He, he, he has given up on Quebec. So, and in Quebec, there are certain things you can't do. Mm -hmm. Yes, because people will stand up to you. And the mayor of Montreal basically came back the next day and hit back, according to CTV, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev showed a lack of respect for elected officials by calling the mayors of Montreal, Quebec City, incompetent on social media, Valérie Plante said Friday. She is the mayor of Montreal. She said she was, quote, quite disturbed by the Tory leader's comments on Thursday when he accused her and Mayor Bruno Marchand, that's of Quebec City, for stalling new housing construction in their respective cities. Quote, we keep on talking about mental health and now he wants, and, and how we want everyone, the, all of society, to be respectful to each other. He calls himself a leader and attacking personally, naming people, calling them names. To me, it is so disrespectful to my job, his job, anyone's job, and also the type of climate, the social climate we want to be a part of, Plant said Friday in an interview with CGAD 800. A day earlier, conservative leader had shared a quote from Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation analyst Francis Cortellino in a January 16th Radio Canada report in which he said, quote, in Quebec, there have never been so few houses built since 1955, the year data became, began to be collected. In an interview with CTV News, Cortellino said there is a shortage of standalone homes, but more high-density apartment buildings are going up. Mm. Quote, if you look at single-family home starts, it's true there was a big decrease in 2023, and it was the lowest level, and it was the lowest level in 1955. I'm not quite sure. There's some word missing in that quote there. He said Friday. But at the same time, there's apartment starts, and this was what we've been building mostly in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Polyev vowed to tie federal money for your municipalities based on the number of homes they build if he becomes prime minister. Quebec City's mayor accused him of petty politics and expressing contempt for elected officials and for all those who work on housing issues in our city. According to Plant, Polyev's assessments of the housing situation didn't account for the complexity of housing needs in her city and her administration's goal to increase the number of housing units for vulnerable populations. She said in the interview that her administration is always tr already trying to cut down red tape on permits for developments to go ahead and cited her 2020 bylaw, which requires private developers to incorporate 20% social housing, 20% affordable housing, and 20% family housing in new housing projects. So, That's the mayor of Montreal? That's the mayor of Montreal. And I, I, I now, get to Montreal frequently. I haven't been in a few months now, but uh, I can tell you this. Montreal has been on a building binge uh, of apartment buildings and condo towers in the downtown core over the last 15 years. There was, there was a, a long glut of construction in Montreal, and that is well in the past. There's more construction taking place in that city now than there have been in the last 50 years. I'm, I'm not joking. If you, I, I, I frequent a, a couple of different architectural uh, forums, and one of them talks about all of the projects that are going on in Montreal right now, and it's just mind-blowing how many there are. Same thing here in Ottawa, same thing in Toronto. If you are able-bodied and have a skilled trade and are looking for work, uh, we have it in Quebec and we have it in Ontario. In, in the three biggest cities. Canada, Ottawa's, I think, Ottawa Gatineau is the fourth largest uh, census metropolitan area in Canada after uh, Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. I think it's then it's Calgary, then Edmonton. Correct me if I'm wrong. 
I think that's how that how it falls. Yes. Yeah. And that, again, census metropolitan area because that's Ottawa and Gatineau included in that. Ottawa itself is about one million one hundred thousand people, and there's about uh, just under half a million in Gatineau. So we're almost one point six million in Ottawa Gatineau right now, and growing yeah. rapidly. If you put this one up here, this is the one again. So it seems that uh, Pierre's Polyev's favorite new word is incompetent, because I can't, I, um, are you sending me a link he, or are you just? I have share screen. Okay, I don't see it. Oh, there it is. Sorry, my, my apologies. <laughs> well, I want to turn on. There we go. There we go. So he tweeted a CP24 article the other day with the title, Breaking Toronto Homeowners to See 10.5% Tax Bump Under Olivia Chow's First Proposed Budget as Mayor. And he goes, this is what you get when you elect NDP slash liberal politicians. Massive tax hikes. Only common sense conservatives will cut your taxes. Yes, because reducing government revenues is a good way to help people when they're in need. Uh, then he basically subtweets himself, <laughs> tweeting that, saying, Incompetent NDP, NDP liberal city politicians raised Toronto's taxes 10.5%, just like Trudeau. Hands in your pocket, not worth the cost. Common sense conservatives will cut your taxes. So Olivia Chow is incompetent because she is forced to respect the law mm -hmm. that says that Budgets must be balanced when you're part of the city. When she's dealing with the premier that's sitting on over $5 billion of surplus but won't free any up. But she's the incompetent one. And then Valérie Plante is incompetent on housing. And Bruno Marchand, the mayor of Quebec, is incompetent in housing. And here's the thing. For a party that traditionally has a big, 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 big problem, mm -hmm getting itself elected in urban areas and for a party that keeps on promising that it is going to fix housing and that it is going to reduce crime. How do you think you're going to be effective on housing and policing when you have to deal with city mayors when you've spent the last two years before coming into power? Should you get power calling them incompetent and insulting them? He doesn't know how to do this, does he? How not to make friends? Well, you mentioned the five billion dollar surplus that Doug Ford is currently sitting on. Do you know that hospitals in Ontario are borrowing money from lenders to keep their budgets afloat because they have to balance their budgets? They're not allowed to run a deficit, but they've been allowed to run a deficit because their funding has been cut by two billion dollars, and Doug's sitting on five billion dollars. Do you see the problem here, folks? Do you see the yeah. problem? And also deviated $13 billion of surpluses to try to build a highway that nobody wants. Yes. Well, I'm sure and there's then, a few people that want it, but I'd say the vast majority of people don't. There's, there's yes. people who do want it. There always is, but the vast majority don't want it. Period. Yeah. And the people who do want it, they're the developers who wanted to buy that land that they can no longer use. And speaking of that land... Internal email suggests Doug Ford's office knew Greenbelt land swap details earlier than claimed. <laughs> Internal email related to the Greenbelt scandal suggests Ford's office was far more involved in the land swap than the Premier has maintained. Uh -huh. Please read from the article. Well, I, I, I don't <laughs> have the whole article because it's... It's a Toronto Star article. I have like two sentences and that's it. A recently discovered internal uh, email related to the $8.28 billion Greenbelt scandal suggests Doug Ford's office was far more involved in controversial land swap than the Premier has maintained. The missive obtained by the opposition New Democrats through a Freedom of Information request contradicts testimony given under oath to the Integrity Commissioner last year. All right. Uh, give me the, the title of the article again. I'll send you the link here. Because I know you, right. you have a way oh, of getting it. I might have a way to be able to get that. Um, so yes, uh, what you were saying about the hospitals. So most Ontario hospitals are facing deficits. Some have reached their financial limits, says the Ontario Hospital Association in this case. Um, this is according to the Ottawa Citizen. Mm -hmm. While they struggle publicly with crowded emergency departments, staff shortages, and hallway medicine, there's another struggle going on behind the scenes in Ontario's hospitals, financial distress. Some hospitals have reached the full limit of their financial capabilities, with a large majority of the province's 140 hospitals projecting budget deficits this year, the Ontario Hospital Association is writing. Hospitals, which are primarily funded by the province, are required to balance their annual budgets. This year, the Ontario government has issued waivers 
to the vast majority of Ontario hospitals, allowing them to carry debt. It's amazing how he can just yeah. just wave his. So I will not wave my hand magically to, fix the to give you the money to fix the problem, but I will wave my hand magically to allow you to carry debt, even though legally this is not allowed. And who who who, who are they borrowing the money from again? Huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some hospitals have been forced to take out high interest loans from banks and others have had to dig into reserve funds to continue operating amid growing extraordinary expenses, a situation that's both highly unusual and not sustainable, he said. Uh, and this is uh, who said Anthony Dale, the president and CEO of the Hospital Association, quote, Hospitals have gone to the banks and other financial institutions to borrow money or are depleting their resources. It is on a scale I have not seen in a very long time that places many hospital boards in a very uncomfortable position. There's deep concern over the uncertainty they face. The situation is particularly dire for hospitals in rural and remote areas of the province. The association is urging hospitals to be patient despite a fiduciary duty to run balanced budgets. Quote, no hospital board that I'm aware of is anticipating the kinds of changes or adjustments that would be needed to provide a balanced budget, Dale said. The alternative is too serious to contemplate. It will require patience. So, the province has wrapped up special pandemic funding, which is one of the reasons why hospitals have a shortfall, even though COVID is not over and we're seeing incredible numbers of people in hospitals because of RSV and influenza. And... Uh, and as we were mentioning on Friday, also uh, uh, invasive strep A. Yes. So people are not some stopped. The emer the initial COVID emergency where people were dropping like flies, and we did not know why, and it was scary. That part is over, but we still have more people dying of COVID in a year now than back then. And you're adding all the other respiratory illnesses, and then you add all the surgical backlogs and everything that's going on. Yes. So even though the emergency, as in, ah, there's this mysterious thing killing people, we don't know what it is, run, hide, that part is over. The numbers of people going to the hospital are not going down. Yet, they have decided that they no longer need the funding to support the numbers, because the numbers are still at emergency level, even though it is no longer an emergency in that sense. Strange way, of but doing we still things. have an emergency situation. By any way, any stretch of the imagination, any way you describe it, when hospitals are at over two hundred percent capacity, this, as is the case in Quebec, or you got twelve ambulances lined up, as was the case of the deck in New Brunswick, yes, three hundred and sixty percent capacity. That's an emergency. Yeah. And again, I, I was talking to a gentleman last night from New Brunswick, and and uh, from from an area that I'm intimately familiar with because I used to live there in Miramichi, Chatham, and he's from that area as well. And we were talking about how, I'm like, please, how, how is it Blaine Higgs has a $2 billion surplus in a province of 820,000 people? How does he come up with a $2 billion surplus? Remember, to quantify how much a billion dollars is, 1 million seconds is 12 days, 1 billion seconds is 32 years. <laughs> and he has basically 64 years worth of money. $2 billion. I just, I don't. Mm -hmm. Now back in Ontario again, right? The pandemic funding has been wrapped up. We're paying three times now for nurses what we were paying before. We're paying these private clinics some of their extraordinary fees. I guess because we're actually helping them to equip themselves to actually perform rather than maximizing use of the surgical rooms that we already have in hospitals by making them run 24 hours or on weekends. So we're choosing to pay more and putting less money in the system and then sitting on surpluses. So we're spend not spending smartly. Then we have... Hospitals being responsible for retroactive payments to staff after Ontario wa Ontario's wage restraint legislation, Bill 124, was declared unconstitutional. Those payments amounted to more than a billion dollars province-wide. Hospitals have to pay the staff as required, but they've only been partially reimbursed by the provincial government. 
Then last month, the Ontario Hospital Association sent a letter to Health Minister Sylvia Jones, President of the Treasury Board Carolyn Maroney, and Minister of Finance Peter Bethan-Falvey, urging the province to speed up remaining reimbursements to hospitals for Bill 124 payments and to begin a broader conversation about sustainable funding for the province's hospitals. Quote, Given the distressed financial position of so many hospitals, we recommend that reimbursement of the remaining retroactive payments be made at the earliest opportunity. Many hospitals, especially organizations serving rural and remote communities, have reached the full limit of their financial capabilities. So basically, instead of spitting, finding a second year on that to make sure that hospitals don't have to take out loans and incur more debt. So basically, the Ontario government is ensuring that money that's supposed to be spent on you, the patient, is not being spent on you and is going to interests, interest for banks by not finding a second year to actually compensate for the money that hospitals still have to pay out in staff because the province decided it was going to pass an unconstitutional law so that it wouldn't have to pay the people that help us keep us alive and healthy what they're actually worth. Yeah. It's absolutely incredible. And that additional pandemic funding that they consider extraordinary, even though the numbers haven't gone down, the Ontario Hospital says, resulted in the province having better pandemic outcomes than many other jurisdictions. So the funding worked, but now they've pulled it. Of course. course so why why have a, a program that works well when we can just kill it kill the program it's just and it seems like i'm jumping all over the place here kids but there's sort of like an overarching theme here meanwhile so we sort of went to hospitals for a bit ctv had a report on the news the national news the other day, I think it was on the 20th, when they were talking about emergency wait times to people that were going to hospitals because there are people there are people dying in hospital now again oh, yes. waiting. It says out of the one hundred and ninety-six billion dollars that the federal government has made available to the provinces last year, last spring, four provinces have signed a deal and taken the money. So not only is Doug Ford, I'm not sure if Doug Ford is one of the four provinces that have signed the deal. If Ontario is one of them or not. Know. They didn't say on the news report which four had. Yes. But we have 10 provinces. And we have six of them who feel that they have the luxury of not taking federal money. And some of them may also be sitting on surpluses as well. And they're allowing the hospitals to starve. What the hell? Circling back to housing. Not only are the conservatives not helping by attacking the mayors, but we also have <sighs> Chuckmeet Singh completely, completely once again disappointing us. Mr. Grizzly, if you would. Uh, okay, just a second here. Here we go. Justin Trudeau says one thing but does the other. I visited Edmonton, Griesbach, where Justin Trudeau promised to build more affordable homes. Instead, he is building luxury condos you can't afford. With this plan, developers get rich, you get gouged. Oh, jug meat. Jug meat. Okay, so the other day he did the thing on dental. We did that with no help from anybody. That was all us, nobody. And now... So, so again, that thing that we keep on saying, will the NDP go into the next election? Is making the case that the conservatives are so bad, they don't deserve to be the government, and they don't even deserve to be the opposition. Or once again, oh, Justin Trudeau never writes, he never calls, I wait for him at prom, and he didn't show up, or he didn't call him. He's going to do that thing again. Well, we have the minister, Sean Fraser. Said, uh, Hi, Jagmeet Singh. A few helpful hacks about this project. It includes affordable units and units at 80% of market value, not, quote, luxury condos. It's being led by Métis partners. and We need more rental units in this country. Projects like this are a big part of the solution. 
technique. So he's literally, Singh is literally lying. Oh, he's parroting Skippy. It's like, dude, not, not cool, man. You're, you're driving a stake into the heart of your party, whether you realize it or not. And there are party members who are like, okay, come on, dude. This is not cool. The party with which you want to contrast yourselves is the opposition, not the government. Mm -hmm. He's just outright lying. Yes, and it's, it's heartbreaking. I said, you've got members of the party who are just, no, I'm out. I'm, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I don't know what the deal is. And I think it was, well, Evan, uh, I, but yeah, I believe it was Evan Scrimshaw, if I'm not mistaken, recently had an article uh, about this. And he basically said, NDP's housing joke, uh, uh, subtitle, I give up. He was like, I eventually like, I give up. Jagmeet Singh has launched another attack on the federal liberals' record, attacking them for supporting the building of air quotes luxury condos in Edmonton. It's a nonsense tautology that ignores some of the housing and the specific project he's attacking is actually sub-market priced housing, done in consultation with local First Nations communities. But more importantly, it's moronic idiot idiocy. Building more effing housing will help alleviate the housing crisis because even if we accept that these are luxury condos, moving rich people from existing housing to new luxury housing frees up their old units for everyone else. I'm not a housing expert, but Singh's policy is literally so stupid that it flies in the face of all basic economics. If you want to lower housing prices, there's three things you can do. Massively lower demand for housing, read slash immigration levels and then freeze them there for at least half a decade. Two, incentivize private buildings to include builder, excuse me, incentivize private builders to increase the number of units available in the markets by building up, aka apartment buildings and condos. Or three, build a metric shit ton of non-market public housing. The latter idea is a good one, but there's a lack of follow-through from Jagmeet on how he'd pay for it, whether he sort of hints whenever he sorts of hints at supporting it. He has yet to come out for reductions in immigration, which are needed. And he constant, consistently attacks private builders' increasing density for reasons passing understanding. Plainly, he's either an idiot or playing one for the cameras. If the NDP is actually okay with this level of in, either intellectual vacancy or this level of deception, they should just disband. If their leader genuinely thinks that building more units of housing is a bad thing, then he needs to be replaced immediately. But he won't, because the party are cowards. And if their leader is lying to the public in an effort to use a housing crisis for political ends while actually working to undermine efforts to fix it, hello, Pierre Polyev, then hell is an insufficient fate for his monstrosity. Quote, there is only one question about you two that actually matters, and I'm still trying to... Fi oh, sorry. That's completely... That's a different thing. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so, Jagmeet is incredibly sanctimonious, incredibly holier than thou, and incredibly willing to say things that just aren't true. The thing about him is whether this is in some ways an act doesn't actually matter because each way it's really effing bad. Jagmeet's housing policy would make the crisis worse, full stop. Even if he committed to mass public building, it would still make things worse because an unfunded liability of the scale that would... Uh, sorry. Maybe. Sorry. An unfunded liability of the scale that wouldn't make a dent into the capacity crisis on an ongoing basis would cause the Canadian debt to trade at somewhere between three and ten times the current levels, bankrupting the entire economy. Jagmeet is either a dangerously stupid man, substantially stupider than even the dumbest Tory MP in the history of this country, or he's a liar. He's either genuinely an idiot or he's lying to the country in an effort to make housing worse to boost the electoral prospects of his party. If you have a strong opinion about which of those scenarios would be worse, great. I don't, because in either scenario, he needs to be gotten rid of. He is a joke, a mockery. Remember when Ed Broadbent died last week and everyone talked about what an honorable and decent fighter for Canadians he was? Ain't no effing way Jug meets epitaphs will be that kind if this is the damage he's doing. I've said it before, but this is actually truly poisonous to political trust in this country. That's the part that I'm having trouble with. It's literally, he's literally putting poison in the water here by making these types of statements. The NDP is supposed to be better than the Liberals. It is supposed to be what the Liberals failed to be. Right. Where the Liberals are arrogant liars, the NDP are supposed to be the honest truth-tellers. The Liberals support the corporate interest while the NDP stands up for workers. The Liberals care about getting elected while the NDP care about doing things for people. 
Well, right now, the NDP are standing with rich homeowners or workers unable to live where they work. They're lying about the Heisen crisis instead of telling the truth, and they're playing politics with a policy crisis. They're frauds because they elected a man who cares more about his vanity than his country. Most politicians, and I'm sure Jagmeet believes this, think their party is the best for their country's interest. I believe every conservative MP believes a Pierre Polyev government would be better for Canada than a liberal one. I disagree, but they sincerely believe it. Mm. Jagmeet claims to believe this, having said that an NDP government would be better than the current liberal government supported by the NDP. But if he actually believes this, he'd resign as leader today, or tomorrow, or any time he actually decided to have effing principles. <laughs> I voted NDP in 2021, and it's the most shameful thing I've done with my eight cracks at exercising my franchise. It is shameful because I helped keep this moronic liar in a job, despite him being manifestly unfit to hold the job of dog catcher, let alone the leader of the NDP. Does it not embarrass everyone out there to be led by a leader who makes an ass out of himself so effing often for no discernible advantage? The NDP is led by a joke. Jagmeet's either an idiot or a liar. There's no polite way to say this about a man who's attacking density in a housing crisis. There can be no pretending he's somehow not the joke that he is. Get a serious leader or get effed. Now, very crude. Yeah, but I, I agree with a lot of his points. I agree with a lot. You just can't go out there and lie. Yeah. Jug meat, you're lying, dude. Not cool. Hey, why don't you come on the show and explain to us why you lied? I'd like to know. Why did you do that? Who is your comms people that are advising you to lie to us? Because you, you're losing people who would vote for you left, right, and center. Lying is not cool. The, and again, like Evan Scrimshaw just said, the NDP... That party is, is supposed to be the one that the basic worker can rely on to prop them up and hold them up. And meanwhile, the guy's just flat out lying to us. Yeah. And speaking about other NDP who are disappointing us, our Friday show, if you watched it, we had our guests, mm -hmm. Jordan's mom mm -hmm. and Leanne Schaefer, our very good friend. They talked about how they were going to announce a petition to make the armories available to house people who are freezing. Mm -hmm. Well, that petition was released. And uh, I will include a link here for you, Mr. Grizzly, to put in the chat for our kids here. But it's at change.org if you're listening. Petition a call to Hamilton City Council to appropriately address homeless encampments. Oh, wait a minute. Is that the right petition? Well, I mean, that one's needed too, but that's not Angela's. Oh, that's not the right one? No, I'm sorry. No, that's, okay. that's not Angela's petition. No, there's lots of them, so. Yeah, there's lots of them. But here, there's this little YouTube clip here that I'll put here for you to put on. It's about a minute 34, Just a but second. this is CHCH News. Covering Angela. Just give me a second here. While I uh, cue this up and we'll show you the video. Here we are. Just a sec while I blow it up. And I will share the video. And uh, I, had, I just have a lot of stuff on my screen here. So bear with me for a second. While I get this ready to roll. Oh, what is going on with my computer? Oh, that's freezing. <clears throat> Oh, yeah. Hang on. Okay. okay, there. I got it now, and I will play this in just a second. I'm running a lot of stuff in the background, so it's it's kind of chugging through my processor at the moment. <laughs> and let's press play. Well, today was another bitterly cold day in southwest Ontario, with a wind chill making it feel more like minus 15. Well, tonight, a Hamilton woman has started a petition to turn the John Weir Foot Armory on James Street North into a warming center. Committee advocate Angela Voss says the armory is ideally suited to accommodate homeless people on a temporary basis. She says the facility has 18,000 square feet of usable space that can accommodate 400 cots, along with cooking facilities, showers, and bathrooms. It seems bizarre to me that taxpayers are paying to heat this large, empty facility all night long. In the meantime, there are some of society's most vulnerable sleeping in tents just down the road. 
In what world does this make any sense? Well, at this point in time, it The sound seems to have disappeared. I'm aware. Hmm. I'm aware. I've got issues going on here. I've got too many things open in the background, and it's killing my computer at the moment in time. So bear with me. I'll get it back up in a sec, okay? All right. Um, while you do that, um, the petition, sorry I gave you the wrong address first. It's uh, hamiltonhelps.com. So Hamilton helps all in one word. Dot com. You can bring it there and it says, Petition to open the armories. We, the undersigned, urge the Mayor of Hamilton, the Minister of National Defense, and the Premier of Ontario to declare an emergency and negotiate the use of the John Ware Foot armories in downtown Hamilton to accommodate the homeless men and women living in tents and around Hamilton during the coldest days of winter. The armories have room and facilities that are ideal for a warming centre. The men and women of the Canadian Armed Forces are off, after... Off, sorry men and women of the CAF after often deployed for domestic emergencies. Under sections 276 and 276.3 of the National Defence Act of the Canadian Armed Forces can be called upon by a province or territory to help civil authorities when they are unable to deal with the situation with their own resources. In the case of a severe homelessness crisis exacerbated by winter conditions, this could include logistical support, setting up temporary shelters, or providing emergency supplies and medical aid. Homelessness is a crisis and winter exacerbates that crisis and creates an emergency situation threatening the lives of men and women of our community. Add your name and support. Sekir and I will uh, put this in the chat. And as the petition says in here, the armories can house 400 plus cots. It has nine men showers, five women showers, eight male, eight plus male toilets, nine women's toilets, three kitchens, and eight hundred square feet i've got the clip uh, queued up and ready to go again I'd, uh, all right I'll play the rest of it here from where angela was putting up her poster and there's no sound again <laughs> uh, yeah. tech we're trying to do some good here I'm trying one more time one more time. <laughs> okay let's try this again work with us it's a little frustrating some days. Just a sec here. Let's see. All right. Come on. Let's see if this works this time. I'll try it one more time. And if this doesn't work, we'll just have to try it another day. It seems bizarre to me that taxpayers are paying to heat this large, empty facility all night long. In the meantime, there are some of society's most vulnerable sleeping in tents just down the road. In what world does this make any sense? Well, at this point in time, it's not a solution that's going to be feasible for us. It's not as easy as simply finding a, a building that's empty uh, or a building that appears to be unused. In fact, it takes a bit more than that. We have to ensure the building is set up and suitable for the people that we would be using it for and for the purpose that we would use it for. And at the end of the day, we actually need staffing and an agency to operate it. Director of Housing Services Michelle Baird says the city is focusing on expanding existing services, pardon me, while also finding new opportunities to bring on site. You'll find a complete list of daytime and overnight drop in and warming spaces on the city of Hamilton's website. And that is Taz Boga reporting, who uh, used to be. Um, she, went, she worked here in Ottawa. Remember Taz Boga? Was she was, I can't remember which network she was. She used to do the news here in Ottawa years ago, Taz Boga, and then she moved on to Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Now, Andrea Horvath on the news is saying the same thing, you know, views about vacant buildings was, you know, you know, all these types of things. We have to make sure it's all that kind of stuff, right? It's like somebody on Twitter said, and this is the point, that Horvath is not getting it. She says homeless need more support. No, they need somewhere not to freeze to death. Yes. First, it's the same thing with the addictions thing. Mm -hmm. We have to bring them to treatment. They have to like want to kick the habit and it's like that. No, you need to keep them alive long enough to earn their trust to convince them that it might be a good idea to go to treatment. A decision that they have to make on their own and come to to their own, or else treatment is more likely not to be effective. 
If you're not willing to do those other steps, then you're not willing to bring them home healthy. Well, you know, you're willing to let them die. Well, because is what you're willing to do. They would be deemed, uh, and I'm going to say this in, in quotation, undesirables. So they will just let them die in the streets because obviously they don't care. I mean, it, it's it's pretty obvious to me they don't care because if they did, they would actually do something. Now I understand. Right. I understand trying to get the place ready to house a lot of people quickly is not easy. But what we're talking about a warming center right now. Yes. First. Not a residence, a place for people can be warm and not freeze to death. Yes. And we have Laura Babcock, who we know how's the homelessness is a big issue for her, who lives in the area. Yes. Like, ugh. There are short, mid, long-term strategies to solve a problem, and there are immediate, urgent responses to a crisis. People in homelessness freezing on cold cement tonight need an urgent response. Mayors of other cities get that. Why does Andrea Harvath? So, was, this is causing me to ask: Was this woman ever NDP? I, I said ever. she never was. I said that a long time ago. Because if she were truly NDP, she would have been all over this a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Not only, not only. Is she not making that available? But there are padlocks on, on the gates yeah. now. Yeah. Meanwhile, meanwhile in Ottawa, the federal government, news release January 19th, as Ottawa continues to face extreme weather, the government of Canada and the city of Ottawa are partnering to offer vulnerable people and those experiencing homelessness a warm indoor space to rest. Public Services and Procurement Canada has signed an agreement with the City of Ottawa to temporarily use the Graham Spry Building located at 250 Lanark Avenue as a temporary emergency overnight center for those seeking refuge from the cold. Expected to open on January 20th, the center will provide a safe and warm space for up to 45 people at a time. The Graham Spry Building is one of 10 federally owned buildings in the National Capital Region identified for disposal by the PSPC. PSPC continues to work with the public community organization and other stakeholders to identify new opportunities to leverage its surplus assets to support housing and other community needs. PSPC is developing a long-term real estate portfolio plan to optimize federal office space, lower operating costs, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and serve local communities. Quote, during these colder months, it is essential that we work together to protect everyone in our communities, including those who are more vulnerable. This partnership with the City of Ottawa will do just that as we find ways to accelerate and streamline the process of converting surplus federal properties into affordable housing and redesign space that will benefit Canadians, we are seeking meaningful opportunities to use these properties to best serve local communities. The Honorable Jean-Yves Duclos, Minister of Public Services and Procurement. So the federal government is open, is open to doing this. And as Kit Angela just said here on the quotes, the armories, are already ready because they have to be ready in case of emergencies. It's a military building. Yeah. So here's, here's, and there's no lack of community volunteers, as Leanne says, that would be certainly willing to sign up a sheet and say, you know what, you need staff, we'll do it. Here's the thing, and Angela just hit the nail on the head. The city doesn't want to do a damn thing about it, clearly. So here's what we do we call in the military and say, listen, we need some help here. Here's what we need help with your building, the armory which is in the city of Hamilton, needs to be a place to keep people alive. Can you help us with that? I, I think the military would be amenable to that. And it looks like that we have a federal government that's quite as amenable to it as, as well. Well, here, here's a case in point. Remember the ice storm in 1998? Remember mm -hmm. how quickly they were able to get uh, uh, armories and school gyms and that organized and heated uh, and created shower facilities for people who had no power for weeks on end. Mm -hmm. We got that together pretty quickly. Oh, that's right, because they were homeowners. Ah, ah, there it is. Ah, there's the difference. <sighs> I, 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 I do not know what has happened to the NDP. Well, they've abandoned their their ideals, it seems. Broadbent would be spinning in his grave. Yes. yes. Like on the earth has, ground hasn't even settled yet. For a man who said that Ed Broadbent was his mentor. He should, uh, he should do a little bit more to, uh, you know, actually keep Ed Broadbent uh, happy and proud of him because he ain't doing it.
Like, what the hell, man? Yeah. And and look, we realize that that this issue is is the city of Hamilton and the mayor of Hamilton, former NDP, provincial NDP leader Andrea Horvath. We get that. It's this is not Jug Meat, but Jug Meat's not doing a damn thing to to help anybody. So, bro, brah, seriously, man, come on, stop lying to us and do something to help people. It's not like Jug Meat Singh and Andrea Horvath haven't worked together before. Mm -hmm. It's not like he doesn't have her number. But again, I mean, he's busy torching the party brand in his own right, lying that housing projects that are indigenous led are actually luxury condos when they're 80% below market. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, clearly he's not caring about the party brand either. Clearly. It, and, and the NDP has so lost its way. Provincially in Western Canada, the NDP, although admittedly they are more of in line with Brian Mulroney and Joe Clark's progressive conservatives, I'd say more Joe Clark than Brian Mulroney, uh, but they are, as Wab Canoe, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, we're willing to give you a hand up if you meet us halfway. And, and I've always been on board with that. I've always been on board with that. And, and you got to understand too, when he says that, it's not like, oh, okay, well, get out there, kick your wheelchair over and get up and go to work. That's not what he's saying. You want to get clean, sober, if you're somebody who's suffering from an addiction, you want to get clean and sober and, and contribute to society, okay, we'll put supports in place for you, but you have to put in the work. We can't make you do it. You put in the work and we'll be here to support you. We will give you a hand up, not a handout, a hand up. And I'm on board with that. I always have been. Now, here's the thing about a hand up. People need a place to live. They need a roof over their head, living on the street. You're not giving a handout if you give somebody a place to live. And again, I know a number of progressive conservatives who are like, you know, we were able to build barracks really quickly in World War II. And a lot of those buildings are still standing and still housing people. We should be able to build new ones quickly to get people into housing. And look, you don't need a big place. And people are, well, we can't put it, you know, people don't go to shelters because they're double back, triple stacked high beds and people get stolen. Yeah, I know. We're not, we're not calling for that. Build barracks. Each person gets a small private space in a giant heated uh, place. You could put in shower rooms, communal shower rooms with individual stalls like they have at the spa. If you go to the spa, it's not a, it's not like the, the hockey rink where you're standing around a dozen shower heads and a whole bunch of naked guys are standing there soaping each other up. And I'm like, well, not soaping each other up, soaping themselves up, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it, now, um, it's easy to do this. The will isn't there from levels of government. If it was there, it would have been done already. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Now we have Kit Angela um, saying here in the chat the history of the, just want to make sure I get it right, the John Weir Foot Armory. Mm -hmm. He was the only chaplain to receive the Victorian Cross. He would be honored for us to use his building to save those who are suffering. To which Kit Leanne adds, don't we have legislation and things set up for emergencies when emergencies happen? These things are already in place. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. But the people who have the authority to pull that lever have to consider something, an emergency, and I guess people, I'm guessing, that don't matter, I'm guessing freezing to death on the street is not an emergency to them. Yeah, clearly, they don't care. Clearly, they don't care here. Um, the petition is doing well in terms of getting public attention because we also have Cameron Croach who's a Hamilton resident uh, and Ward 2 city councillor, has also been promoting it and said, thanks to those who started this petition to ask governments to declare an emergency and open the armories to help those who have been deprived of housing. It may not be easy, but it's worth our best efforts to try. Lives depend on it. So there is at least one ally on council, Kit Angela and Kit Leanne. And you definitely have Laura Babcock in your corner. 
just because when the petition was out, I made sure she saw it. And she took it and she ran with it. So, and uh, we're going to do what we can here. And we know that the federal government is open to being a partner there. So maybe it's a case of uh, bypassing. I mean, I don't know. I guess, could you bypass? Well, I guess the city would kind of have to staff it somehow. I guess yes. that's where the thing is, is happening. It's not the building not being willing to be open. It's the city not being willing to staff it. Well, that's why I said let's let's call in the military. Uh, call in the military in times of an emergency. People are freezing to death on city streets in Canada in 2024. If that doesn't constitute an emergency, well, then I don't know what does. So then it's maybe a question of placing a call to the Minister of National Defense, Canada, Bill Blair. Maybe. Maybe, maybe we get in touch with Bill Blair and say, is there something you can do to help out here? People are freezing on the streets of Hamilton. People are freezing yes. on the streets of Ottawa. Armories are empty most of the time, and they have space where we could put in cots to house people for warming centers. We're not making it a shelter. It's a warming center where people can come and get out of the cold, get a cup of coffee, maybe a sandwich, get a shower, change their clothes. <sighs> This is a good quote from uh, Rhiannon. Put Doug Ford in a tent overnight, and the next day the homeless will be given a free cottage complete with a beehive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Got Laura Babcock there asking uh, Councillor Croach. Thank you, Councillor, after he said, you know, he wanted to thank people that uh, started this petition. Thank you, Councillor. Can you find out why the padlocks were put on after the petition gained momentum? It's really difficult not to see this as a message that our suffering neighbors aren't good enough to shelter from the deadly cold in the armories. Nobody wants to. She knows how to word oh, yeah. things, doesn't yeah. she? Nobody wants to, to, to live on the street and freeze to death at night. Nobody wants that. There are some people who cannot live within the confines of society. There are. There are not many of them. There's very, very few. Yeah. Now, to his credit, the counselor answered, I don't think I can. Unfortunately, it's run by the federal government. The best bet to get an answer to this is by reaching out to our MP. I'll tag him and hope he can follow up soon. It might be best to contact his office directly, Matthew Green, NDP MP. Well, there you go. Way to go, Matthew Green. For that Green. area. Putting put the work in. Putting the work in. We appreciate that. Right. So uh, Kit Angela and Kit uh, Leanne maybe uh, giving a, a call or asking uh, Matthew Green for a, for a meeting might help you. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you, Angela. I wanted to do tiny homes in tiny township or even just plots of land so people could have fire and resources, but the bylaw says no habitation, threatened to charge me $20,000 a day. Now, I, I do, as somebody who's worked in construction and has been around uh, safety and requirements, uh, I, I understand where the city's coming from on this. You do need to have, uh, whereas this is why the armory is a better choice. There are, are facilities, uh, fresh drinking water. My thumb, I can't, <laughs> I don't know. The camera recognizes that. I, I don't even know it does it on Zoom. There are facilities with fresh drinking water. There are sanitation facilities. There are showers. It is a warm area. There's a place to cook, and it's all in a safe environment. The concern about building a small, tiny township, if it's not built to code or standards, you could have the whole thing burned to the ground. And I get that. So I, I agree with you, Angela, but I understand where the city's coming from on this, which is why let's get people into the armories. They're there. They're safe. They're protected. They're heated. They have fresh drinking water. They have showers. They have toilets. It's it's workable. So we got let's reach out to the military and say, hey, this is what's happening. We've got this big empty space that we're paying money to keep heated. Why don't we put it to use to help people? I think the military would be amenable to that. I would certainly hope they would. Yeah, me too. Well, I mean, you saw you saw what the Canadian Army did when the ice storm hit. They deployed yep. what was it? 20,000 troops, or I can't remember, it was a, a massive deployment of troops who came out to help. 
and were here for quite some time. They were here until it was all, until the system was back up and running. And you had people who were like, okay, what do you need me to do? They're like, just go clear wood, just go clear this, just go do that. You know, not all of them were linesmen, but linesmen, we still call it that, or electricians or anything like that. But they, they deployed those folks too to help get the electrical grid up and running. Asplund, which is the largest, has the largest fleet of bucket trucks in the world, which is a um, arbory type company, did not have a presence in Canada until 1998 when they shipped up a whole bunch of people from uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania and upstate New York who came to help out with the ice storm. And they established a foothold in Canada and kept a lot of those trucks here and employ a lot of people. Uh, I don't know if I'm stumping for a, an American conglomerate there, but. They did a lot of good work during that time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and, and yeah, you're right. Mohan points it out to me, long-term care homes during, during the start of the pandemic, the military came in and helped out. The military will help people. Fundamentally what people join the air force or the army or, or the Navy for is to help Canadians. It's a sense of service to the country and your fellow community members. And when you wear that Canada badge, you represent every single Canadian in the world, by the way. Your community is every Canadian on earth when you put that Canada patch on your shoulder and, and swear an oath to the country and, the, and, and to hold up the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Constitution. You are a member of a very sacred and special community. You're going to help people. So, yeah, let's let's see what we can do to get the military involved in this. Yeah, let's see what we can do. All right. Um, as we get ready to wind down, because we've had a couple of heavy stuff, um, we'll s do a little celebration of Canadians that uh, have done us proud. But first, um, there's a, um, a loss that we have to uh, talk about. Um, Buffalo. I know that uh, Mr. Grizzly, you say that you, um, you, uh, you really respect our Canadian Olympians in particular, and uh, we lost a good one. Um, if the name Sean Barber rings a name bell for you at all, he was a Canadian pole vault champion for us who had uh, won, I believe, the gold medal at the Pan Am Games in 2015. Uh, and yeah, he uh, passed away. yes, and made the final at the 2016 Rio Olympics in a pole vault event, uh, that was won by Brazil and had a best vault of six meters, which was 19 feet, eight and a quarter inches in uh, Nevada, which remains the Canadian record. Unfortunately, um, he passed away from medical complications at the age of 29. Yeah. We don't know what the, what the, um, complications were they haven't released that yet but yeah sad so, um sad news um yeah i think this is quite a feisty competitor so just wanted to mention that in passing um and, and the youth olympic and sorry, sorry. i was, was going to say you remember my my dedication to olympic athletes because there's no guarantee of a payoff what he was doing right. pole vault there's no money in that like zero that, that there's no, I mean, there's in Europe, you can do a uh, tour as a track and field uh, athlete, but are you going to make an exclusive living at it? No. And again, it's a short window of opportunity you have to, to do that sport. It's not like you could be a, a I don't know, a Nolan Ryan and pitch for 25 years in the major leagues. Mm. or be a basketball player for 20 years or a hockey player for 20 years. It's a track and field event, a lot of injuries and at pole vault, especially that's, there's a limited window of opportunity to be able to, to do that sport. And again, it's not, there's no payoff. So you're doing it for the love of the sport and wanting to represent your country. So that my salute. Absolutely. And, um, also going on in the world, right now it doesn't get as much attention but the youth olympic games mm. have started uh they're in korea i believe this year and um, the chef de mission is olympic curler lisa weagle 
So curlers who know it, he actually actually has a shot named after her <laughs> in curling. Uh, but yes, the, the Youth Olympic Games are taking place in Gangwon, South Korea, from January 19th to February 1st. Team Canada has sent 79 athletes over there. So we will wish them good luck and hope that they have a, a very good competition. Um, we had our, sorry, <laughs> I thought I had brought it up, but I had not. Uh, our flag bearers for that were Charlie Beatty, who is a freestyle skier, and curler Chloe Fedyuk. And uh, they uh, carried our flag into the opening ceremonies. There's some uh, video on uh, Twitter, if you would like that, of Lisa Weagle uh, making the announcement to them and then being super, super happy to get that honor, mm. which is uh, really great. I have something for you here. I don't know if you saw this headline just the other day. Uh, was it yesterday? It might have been yesterday. I'm not even sure. Uh, yes, it was yesterday. Share this on the screen. And we'll talk about it in a second here. Loblaw brings back 50% discounts on expiring items in stores after backlash. What will other grocers do? So what Loblaw was doing, uh, they used to have 50% off things that were about to expire. And they changed it to 30%. They said, we're just matching the market because other stores went to 30%. Matching the market. You mean gouging consumers? Is that what, yeah, that's what you're doing? Is that what you're doing? Gouging consumers. And usually when people are buying the 50% off about to expire items, it, it, it's not because they really like the item, it's because that's all they can afford. <sighs> mm -hmm. Indeed. So yeah, that's a uh, kind of a reversal. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess once again, you know, got a little too greedy, and I guess they had some public going, "What the hell?" and then realized that this was a bad PR move. Yeah, it all started with an email from Loblaw last week confirming its, its intention to reduce the discount on fresh expiring food items for fifty to thirty percent in stores where the previous policy still held. The rollout of this change was scheduled to occur over several weeks across the country, impacting many of their banners. I'm not going to name them. It's worth noting that many other stores had already abandoned this practice years ago. However, the timing of this decision, this decision in January 2024, when many consumers were grappling with financial challenges, did not sit well with Canadians. Not one bit. Hmm. Hmm. Pushback. It works. Yeah. You have a voice, yes, folks. Yes. Use it. And in, in 2016, Loblaw reversed its decision to stop carrying French's projects of products after facing a, a significant public backlash, famously known as the Ketchup Wars. During that time, consumers boycotted the stores, driven by a sense of patriot patriotism and a desire to support tomato farmers in Leamington, Ontario, whose Heinz plant had recently been saved by a contract with French's to produce tomato paste, a major competitor to Heinz. Loblaw saw its sales plummet within days. Again, when you vote with your wallet, when you exercise your rights, as a consumer and a Canadian and choose to not shop at a store that is doing things that you disagree with, you have power. We have power. All right. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, uh, do we have a we show? We do indeed. All right. Kits and Cubs, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We love making this for you. We hope that you enjoyed listening to us. And uh, thank you for your patience <laughs> waiting for me this morning. Really, really appreciate it. I'm very, very, very grateful. Um, because sharing is caring, please tell your kids and take your kids, tell your peeps and poops all about us and uh, spread the word about our show. If you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, you don't have to, thanks to the Ray Girl. You just scan that QR code that's under my chin and that will bring you to our pod page site. That's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words and when we have something fresh off the bandwidth we will come directly to you as well if you would like to support us in other ways you please can visit our youtube page true north eager beaver media and 
There we have like, share, and subscribe buttons for you to smash with. So make like Kit Elaine and make your merry way there and uh, click on L, click on all the things. Click on all the things. <laughs> we appreciate that very much. And if you would like to support us in other ways, then we have our coffee page where our tip jar for the Eager Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund. That's where you can find it there. And if you would uh, like to drop a couple of toonies in there, we would really appreciate that. So you scan the QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head or you go to coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word, as did Kit Adam the other day to leave us a little something. And uh, Kit Adam says, uh, Ace Mag on all platforms, just wanting to buy a Guinness and a Caesar tomorrow. Hopefully I can log on from the West Coast because... Uh, Adam did tune in for a little bit to our pubcast. Nice. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. And th thank you to all of you who did as well, who joined us uh, for the pubcast this weekend. Uh, if you're happening to be listening on podcast, our pubcast is our once a month event that we do where we do not discuss politics whatsoever. So it's more like the opening of our shows. Mm -hmm. This one we banter but, and we talk about other but things. Long format, but, like four, just, four but, or five, six hours sometimes. Yeah. This one was a short one for us. Mm -hmm. um, Three and a half hours. But yes, but it is available exclusively on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can't get it on our podcasts. So uh, make sure that you take a visit over there and uh, look for the February podcast. Uh, the February, the January, January podcast. Podcasts. I've been doing that all month long. Our, our, our podcast content is exclusive uh, on uh, visual only. Uh, you can get it on YouTube. It, it is, of course, streamed across multiple Twitter feeds and that, but it is uh, exclusive to YouTube in the sense that if you want to join the chat for the podcast, which is always fun, you want to check out the YouTube channel uh, where you can li like, share, and subscribe. Our three favorite words after free beer today. Free beer today. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, because democracy is something that you do. Please go to www.hamiltonhelps.com and sign Kit Angela and Kit Leanne's uh, petition to try to get that armory open. Um, if you are in the Hamilton area, please give a call to MP Matthew Green and ask him uh, what's up I'm to be seized happening. with this issue. And to see whether or not he can give a call. If you are uh, residing in Bill Blair's riding or electoral district, I do not know which one it is off the top of my head, but I will try to look for it. Represent Scarborough Southwest. If you live there, give him a call and let him know that you would like him to take action on that uh, or ask for a meeting as well. Um, call your city councilors if you live in the Hamilton area. And that's anywhere in Canada. Yes. You know, if you want a warming center, Talk, yeah. call your city councilors, apply some pressure, call your MPPs. This, if there's a minister in your area, call them too. Let them know that uh, you want our governments to take care of people because that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to care for us. All right. I believe that's everything. Mr. Grizzly, what are your words of wisdom? Uh, yeah, keep involved. If um, I guess my words of wisdom today is, is, is if you know somebody somewhere who uh, battles depression and anxiety like I do, reach out to them. You don't have to have probing questions. Just reach out to them. Say, hey, how's it going? Uh, how are things? You want to get together for a cup of coffee or just sit and talk or watch a sporting event or something check in on your on your folks who are who are suffering through through depression because this is the toughest time of the year for a great many of us when there's almost no sunlight and it's really cold and trying to get out of the house some days is just you don't have the energy to do it so yeah check on your peeps please and to that uh, at 9 p.m this evening if you are free i will be uh performing performing well, i don't know my ASMR channel, I just put a link in the chat there. For those of you who need some uh, mental health chat and some ASMR type feed where I speak in a soft, soothing voice like this All right, man. and tell you everything will be okay. Just we have to work at it together.
So if you have time this evening, 9 p.m., on my YouTube channel, I will be uh, having the mental health chat for today. All right. Mr. Grizzly, roll the credits, and uh, we'll have a bit of Canadians who make us proud from our athletes. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. All right, some good news from our athletes. Our golfers have been tearing it up. Last week at the Sony Open in Hamilton. In Hamilton. <laughs> you got Hamilton on the mind, do you? Wow. On ho- Thank you so much, kids. So like, okay, this show has been a little more disjointed and definitely not our smoothness, That's fine. given that I rolled out of bed and tried. So, you were uh, a little more if, mellow if, this morning. You were, you were if, you know, yeah. ASMR almost. <laughs> if it was harder to follow us today... That's my bad. It's all good. Just sorry. I promise you a smoother show tomorrow. Um, at the Sony Open in Hawaii, we had three Canadians finish in the top 20. Nick Taylor, who did us proud by winning the Canadian Open uh, last summer on home, home soil, took a seventh place. Taylor Pendrith took a tenth. And Ben Silverman took an 18th. And then those golfers uh, followed it up again this week. Uh, it was Adam Hadwin this week at the American Express Tour uh, stop at the PGA Tour who took a sixth place, and then AJ Cockrell at the DP World Tour Dubai Desert Desert Classic took a fourth place. And if that wasn't enough, Brooke Henderson at the LPGA Tour the Hilton Grand Vacations Tournament of Champions took a third place. Way to go, Brooke! Our golfers are just. Killing golfers. it, no matter where, no matter where, no matter our what golfers, tour. Or, or tennis players, or skiers, or swimmers. Yeah, Canada is slowly taking over the athletic world. Yes, uh, our men and women's field hockey Olympic teams were fighting for Olympic qualification. Unfortunately, uh, both did not make it out of the tournament, so there will be no field hockey for Team Canada uh, at the Summer Olympics this year. Sadly. Um, in tennis at the Australian Open, um, that we have no more players left in singles. Um, Felix Ogieliasim was taken out in the third round by number three in the world, Daniel Medvedev, which is uh, what was kind of an expected result. Not that Felix can't beat Daniel Medvedev and has in the past, but he's recovering from injury. Right, right. He's on the way back. So, um, so that was probably a tough order at the moment. But Gabriela Dabrowski. Uh, is doing quite well uh, in doubles. She has now reached the quarterfinal and is uh, still there. And also in the mixed doubles tournament with her partner, I believe, Neil Lamons from the UK. And that one, she has also reached the quarterfinal round. So, and uh, based on her seating, um, she looks very, very, very well placed to make semifinals uh, at least uh in mixed doubles and all the way to the final in actual doubles mm. this year. So uh, let's keep our fingers crossed for her. Hope that she brings back uh, another title because, you know, she uh, she has two mixed double Grand Slam titles. And then last year, she finally got her first doubles title mm. at the age of 31 after several years of trying. And, well, they also just won the Billie Jean King Cup. So... If anybody in doubles right now has wind in their sails, it is Gabriella Dabrowski. Cool. Well, so, here's to her. Hopefully, she can go out and kick some more butt. Absolutely. And then there's a whole bunch of other great results uh, from our uh, winter athletes that we'll get into later on during the week. Uh, but one name to start looking out for is a cross-country skier named Antoine C. Not familiar. Out of Quebec. 
who just took now cross country skiing. You often enter events and there's like 120 mm-hmm. skiers or yes. something, right? So just like making the top half is good. Mm-hmm. Um, well, he participated in the 20 kilometer classic at the World Cup in Oberhof, and he took an eighth place there. And this is not his first top 10 of the year. Uh, he's actually ranked, ranked in 12th place overall so far this season for all events. So we have an emerging cross-country ski star, kids. So keep your eyes on this young man. Antoine Cyr is his name. Cool. All right. And then we have more. There was some wins and moguls and pre ski and a whole bunch of stuff and ski cross, but we'll bring that to you during the course of the week because our winter athletes, they're killing it again. Of course they are. All right. Kids and cubs, have a beaverific day. I'll see you.